Good morning. Uh, I would say good morning, everyone uh, in the room and uh, 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 connected online. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary General Jens, uh, for uh, joining us. I was uh, telling the Secretary General normally this room would be crowded and full of students, extremely excited and uh, probably uh, clapping and, uh, uh, and getting up uh, uh, as uh, we entered the room. The cold atmosphere is only due to the strict uh, uh, observation of the COVID rules, uh, but uh, uh, I hope we can transmit to you the enthusiasm that we all have in having you here. It is for us uh, really a great honor and a pleasure, for me personally, a great pleasure to host you, I think for the first time uh, in the College of Europe in Bruges, uh, and uh, um, to uh, have you addressing uh, our students, but also the wider public, because uh, um, through the um, so the live stream of, the, uh, of this event, uh, uh, we also reach out uh, beyond uh, our students uh, for uh, um, not only a speech, but I would say a conversation, an interactive exchange with our students uh, from the International Relations and Diplomacy Department. Uh, they are doing this week uh, a virtual study trip. Uh, we normally have study trips. Uh, uh, the International Relations Department normally go to Geneva. Uh, to the UN. Uh, this year, uh, traveling is uh, not possible, so we have tried to bring the travel to Bruges, either virtually and in your case, uh, and really we're grateful for that uh, in, uh, in presence. Um, this, um, um, I think you don't need any presentation, for sure to our students, but also to the wider public. Still, uh, um, I, I think it is uh, uh, good for me to introduce to you uh, our students, again, the International Relations uh, and Diplomacy Department uh, will be interacting with you after your introduction, uh, but also uh, all our other students uh, are, uh, are joining us. In particular, um, we have uh, also the students from the Master in Transatlantic Affairs program that are following online uh, in a special setup, so they are also invited to interact with you and to ask questions. For the sanitary measures, we are only allowed to have five students in the room. We are uh, strictly respecting that. But again, uh, I imagine that uh, the envy of the others uh, on them uh, will, be, will be high because indeed I felt the enthusiasm and uh, uh, the excitement of, uh, of not only the student, but I can say also all our staff for your presence here today and my personal one, you know that well. Um, the, um, after your introduction, we will have uh, uh, some, some questions from them, but also from online uh, connected students. Uh, Jens Stoltenberg, as I said, needs no presentation. Uh, he has been uh, uh, the NATO uh, Secretary General since uh, 2014. I don't need to have this written down because I perfectly remember that you started uh, in Brussels a couple of months before I started in Brussels. And uh, uh, I can share with you this anecdote. I think the very first day I was in office, you came to see me. Uh, and it was, uh, if not, I think the first, very first meeting I had as a high representative was with you in uh, the beginning of November 2014. And since then, uh, I have to say we've worked uh, uh, ex in an excellent manner to increase the relations and the partnership between the European Union and NATO. Uh, and this is still continuing. Just last week, you had uh, an exchange with the European Council, with the heads of state and government of the EU member states. And uh, uh, I can say this as, uh, as, uh, as an introduction. Um, Jens Stoltenberg has also been uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Norway, uh, not a member of the European Union, regrettably, I would say, <laughs> but uh, uh, has always been a strong advocate uh, for, uh, for the European Union integration process, I would say, as such, but also uh, a strong advocate of uh, strong uh, partnership and cooperation between NATO and the European Union. And I can tell you, if it was not for him personally, uh, we would have not managed to build the architecture of the European Union defense that is today in place, and we would have never managed to establish the strong partnership that now the European Union and NATO enjoy in all fields of action. And uh, from cyber to hybrid uh, uh, to the operations on the ground, uh, I cannot say anything but words of praising and admiration and recognition uh, and also gratefulness for the support and the contribution that you have given to the European Union NATO partnership. So no surprise that you come today here uh, in the, uh, what I, I define uh, the place where we try to work on the European Renaissance. 
uh, how the younger generations can contribute to shaping the European Union better. With that, I leave you the floor, Jens. Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, the floor is yours. And from the podium, you can take away the mask. Yes. <laughs> So thank you so much, uh, Federica. Thank you for those uh, kind uh, words. Uh, it is really great to see you and to see you again in your new role. And uh, your experience, your knowledge, your background uh, make you the perfect director of this uh, school. And therefore, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here together with you and to be able to continue our uh, cooperation, our collaboration, which we have developed over many years as old friends, but not least uh, the time when you were a uh, high representative, vice president of the uh, European uh, Union, European uh, Commission. Uh, at that time, as you alluded to, uh, we were able to uh, lift NATO-EU cooperation up to unprecedented levels, and that was uh, very much because of your efforts, uh, your commitment, and your leadership, uh, and therefore I'm really glad to be here and to meet with you. And in many ways, it's a continue uh, to strengthen the cooperation between NATO and the European uh, Union and European uh, institutions. Um, uh, so when you uh, reach out and asked whether uh, I was uh, uh, ready, prepared to come here to, uh, to visit, uh, it was very easy for me to say yes. Um, also because I've never been uh, at uh, the College of Europe, never been in this uh, beautiful uh, city before. Um, and, um, but I know a lot about it because I've read, I've heard, I know that this has been an institution, the College of Europe has been an important institution for many, many years. And uh, I know that some students here have been uh, studying NATO, uh, NATO EU in particular, and that, and, and that you also had something called uh, um, uh, uh, model, uh, international model NATO. Uh, uh, which is a project where you actually address and look uh, and study uh, uh, NATO. And of course, as a Secretary of NATO, I welcome that this institution actually links together and focus both on the European Union, but also on NATO and the interaction between NATO and the European uh, Union. I'm happy to address all of you in this room, uh, but of course also all the students uh, following uh, online. Um, and I uh, also know that uh, <coughs> the College of, uh, of Europe is, um, is a, a highly uh, recognized uh, institution building expertise on the uh, European issues, uh, international issues, and you have done that for many, many years. I know it also because I have some Nordic friends um, uh, who have attended this school uh, as students uh, some years ago. And that is Helle Thorning Smith and uh, Alexander Stubb, two Nordic uh, friends who both became prime ministers. So uh, for me, it's obvious that uh, students uh, at uh, this college are destined uh, for great things. Uh, so it's, uh, it's also for that reason great to be here. Then I'm also happy to be here uh, because I am, as, I am a committed European. Uh, I have campaigned for uh, Norway joining the European Union, not only uh, once, but actually twice. And the first time I did so, I was 13 years old, but I strongly believed in the idea of European integration. Uh, and I still believe uh, in the importance of uh, countries coming together, solving uh, uh, all the, uh, and addressing the common challenges they face. And I also see how EU over decades has uh, helped uh, to provide peace and prosperity uh, in Europe. As you well know, we failed to convince uh, the majority of the Norwegian people to, uh, to, to join uh, the European Union. But for me, participating in, for instance, the European Council uh, last week or coming here is a kind of private membership in the European Union. So at least I, uh, I appreciate that opportunity. Um, but as a committed European, I do not just believe in European integration. I also believe in transatlantic integration. Because a strong transatlantic bond is the bedrock of Europe's security. For more than 70 years, NATO has embodied this unique relationship. Our alliance uh, is the only place that brings North America and Europe together uh, every day to discuss common security challenges to preserve peace and prevent war, based on a, our common uh, solemn pledge to protect one another, all for one and one for all. For centuries, conflict in Europe was our constant companion. 
the Seven Years, the Thirty Years, the Hundred Years Wars, the Napoleonic Wars, the Franco-German War, and two world wars are only a few examples of many. And NATO was established back in 1949 to help make that this didn't happen again, to stop this meaningless bloodshed uh, in uh, Europe. The alliance has helped to bring peace and democracy to a divided uh, continent over decades and enabled uh, strong European integration from the very start. For 40 years, Europe and North America stood together in, in NATO to deter the Soviet Union. After the Cold War, we helped, to new, uh, we helped newly uh, freed uh, democra the democracies in uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe to fulfill uh, their Euro-Atlantic as aspirations. NATO membership paved the way for EU membership. And in the 1990s, uh, NATO ended two ethnic wars in the Western Balkans. After 9-11, uh, when the US was attacked, NATO allies stood in solidarity deploying hundreds of thousands of uh, troops to Afghanistan. And today, NATO remains at the forefront of fighting a new, more brutal form uh, of terrorism through the US-led global coalition to defeat ISIS. We have helped, together of course with European allies, to liberate a vast territory and millions of people in Iraq and Syria. Following the uh, Russian uh, illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014, NATO has implemented the largest reinforcement of collective defense in a generation, deploying combat-ready troops in the east of our alliance uh, to deter any aggression. Let's not forget uh, that this attempt uh, to uh, redraw borders by force, as we saw in uh, Ukraine and Crimea, happened only a few years ago. So the need to prevent conflict on our continent and to defend Europe remains very real. And the commitment of NATO uh, and NATO allies to protect and defend each other has therefore not changed. Today, <coughs> NATO stands 30 allies strong and keeps almost 1 billion people safe. But our alliance continues to change as the world around us changes. And we must continue to adapt as we address challenges both old and new. Russia's destabilizing behavior, brutal forms of terrorism, sophisticated cyber attacks, disruptive technologies, the security impact of climate change, and the rise of China. China is not our adversary, but it has the world's second biggest military budget and it does not share our values. The rise of China and uh, all of these global challenges make it all the more important for Europe and North America to work together. Because no single country and no single continent can face these challenges alone. But together in NATO, we represent half of the world's economic might and half of the world's military might. And we now have a unique opportunity uh, to open a new chapter in relations between Europe and North America. I welcome President Biden's clear message on the need to rebuild alliances and strengthening NATO. And I look forward to welcoming uh, him and all other allied leaders to our summit in Brussels later this year. At the heart of our uh, 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 preparations for the summit, and at the heart of the summit, will be the NATO 2030, an ambitious and forward-looking agenda to prepare our alliance for the future. We must reinforce our unity, which derives uh, from our promise to defend each other. By strengthening our deterrence and defense, as well as our political uh, consultations. We also need to broaden our approach to security by increasing the resilience of our societies, maintaining our technological edge, and addressing the security impact of climate change. And we must defend the rules-based order. 
by building a community of global democracies with like-minded countries that share our values. Stronger cooperation with the European Union is part of this ongoing adaptation. NATO and the EU are already working closely together in many areas. Supporting our partners from Afghanistan to Ukraine, countering disinformation and cyber attacks, and working on maritime security. And I see potential for strengthening our cooperation even further. I have stated many times that I welcome EU efforts on defence with the fullest possible involvement of non-EU allies. So I welcome, therefore, the recent US decision to join the project on military mobility, which is a flagship of NATO-EU cooperation. This can enable US and other NATO troops and equipment to move faster across Europe. For instance, to reinforce NATO battle groups in the Baltic region. A European Union that spends more on defence, invests in new capabilities and reduces the fragmentation of the European defence industry is not only good for European security, it is also good for transatlantic security. And that's exactly also why uh, NATO has called for uh, Europe to do more uh, in addressing these challenges, including uh, uh, increasing the competitiveness of the European defence industry. It will be good for Europe, but also good for the whole of uh, NATO. At the same time, we know that EU cannot defend Europe alone. More than 90% of EU citizens live in a NATO country. But EU members provide only 20% of NATO's defence spending. This is not only about money, it is also about geography. Iceland and Norway in the north are, gateway, are gateways to the Arctic. Turkey in the south borders Syria and Iraq. And in the west, the United States, Canada and the United Kingdom together link together both sides of the Atlantic. All these countries are vital for the defense of Europe. And most of all, it is about politics. Any attempt to divide Europe from North America will not only weaken NATO, it will also divide Europe. So I do not believe in Europe alone, or North America alone. I believe in North America and Europe together in NATO in strategic solidarity. Whatever challenges we face, we are stronger together. In uncertain times, we need strong institutions, like NATO and like the European Union, to defend our values, promote our interests, and keep our nation safe and free. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. And I think I will remain here because then I can keep my mask off. Yeah. Good yeah. I know a club of six people in a room is, uh, is unusual, but you have to imagine uh, the virtual club and I'm sure some physical clapping uh, also from all the audience uh, connected uh, from their rooms. I see they're clapping their hands. Uh, and uh, Jens, thank you very much for this, uh, uh, this speech, this introduction. Uh, it's so great to see you here and with these three flags uh, behind you. It's, it really feels, uh, yeah. feels uh, <laughs> a, a right combination. Thank you very much. I will uh, uh, open immediately uh, to questions. I actually have some myself, but I will leave the floor to, uh, to the students. Uh, and I maybe uh, start with uh, Orkan. Could you hear me? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary General, for your presentation. Uh, so my uh, question is about, you mentioned in your speech uh, Ukraine, and uh, my question is uh, about actually the Ukraine crisis uh, that started the same year uh, in 2014 uh, when you became Secretary General. Uh, actually, uh, uh, if uh, Ukraine uh, was a member of NATO, could this country avoid the violation of its territorial integrity? And as the follow-up, uh, we know that in, uh, until 2008, uh, uh, Ukraine and also Georgia, they were preparing their 
uh, membership and they, uh, they could obtain the membership action plan uh, during summit, uh, NATO summit in Bucharest. Uh, and my question is, so why these uh, two countries, Ukraine and Georgia, uh, didn't get MEP uh, that normally leads to NATO membership? Thank you. The short answer is that it could not have happened uh, because the, 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 the court asked the main reason why NATO exists is to defend any ally against any threat and of course to protect the territorial, territorial integrity and sovereignty of uh, all members is, is our main responsibility. So therefore no NATO ally has ever been attacked uh, and, uh, and, uh, and has been uh, also attacked in the way that Ukraine was attacked back in 2014. Uh, because the whole idea is if one ally is attacked, it will trigger the response from the whole alliance. One for all and all for uh, one for all and all for one. So, um, so, 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 so that's the purpose of NATO. But then we also have to understand that the purpose of NATO is, is to prevent it from happening. So the purpose of NATO is to preserve peace. It's not to provoke a conflict, but it's to make sure that if all potential adversaries know that the attack on one ally will trigger the response of the whole alliance, they will not attack. So, so that's the thinking. And that has been extremely important and made NATO the most successful alliance in history. And as you know, and as I referred in my, in my speech, the, the history of Europe has, it's, it's actually a history about wars. Uh, also in part of Europe where I came from, the Nordic, uh, we were fighting each other for centuries. And then, and then, and then uh, after the Second World War, we, uh, because of more than NATO, but NATO, the European Union, the institutions we established after the, the Second World War has, have played a key role in preserving peace in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Um, uh, NATO's door is open, meaning that um, NATO, again, together with the European Union, has helped to spread democracy, the rule of law throughout Europe, especially after the Berlin Wall came down and the Cold War ended. Because then uh, former members of the Warsaw Pact, they first joined NATO and then uh, a few years later, they, most of them decided to join uh, the European uh, Union. Um, uh, and and by, uh, the, through the enlargement of uh, NATO and the European Union, we have been able to uh, spread democracy, the rule of law uh, across Europe. I'm not saying that this is without challenges, without problems, but at least compared to where we were uh, some decades ago, democracy is much more rooted, much stronger in Europe now than it's been perhaps forever. Uh, and NATO has played a part in that, and, and the security guarantees helped uh, to, to facilitate the enlargement uh, also uh, of EU and, uh, and uh, European integration. So that goes hand in hand. NATO's door remains open. Uh, and I was at that summit in, uh, in, in uh, NATO summit in Bucharest where we made the decision that uh, Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO, but we didn't uh, set any fixed date. For a country to become member, they need to meet the NATO standards. Uh, and therefore, my message to both Ukraine and Georgia, two different countries with different uh, uh, so, uh, geography and, uh, and history, um, uh, uh, but both aspiring for NATO membership, uh, my message is that they have to focus on reform, uh, to reform and modernize their institutions, uh, strengthen the, uh, their democratic institutions, fight corruption, implement reforms. NATO and the European Union, but I can speak about for, on, on behalf of NATO, we are helping supporting those reforms efforts. And they are important regardless of whether you think that uh, these countries will become members of NATO in the near future or more distant future, because these reforms are actually uh, helping uh, uh, Georgia and, uh, and Ukraine. Um, the last thing I will say about, uh, yeah, there's one, two more things about mem membership. So we have proven that NATO's door is open because uh, just since 2014, uh, uh, actually two more members have joined, uh, uh, Montenegro and North Macedonia. Uh, so NATO's door remains open. The last thing I will say about mem membership is the following, and that's perhaps the most important thing. And that is that whether a country becomes a member of NATO or not, is to be decided by that country and the members of NATO. No one else. Because sometimes you get the impression that, for instance, Russia has some kind of veto, has the right to, 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 to deny a country the right to join NATO. 
And my message is that actually it is shined in many documents, including documents that Russia signed, that it is an absolute right for every sovereign nation to decide its own path, including what kind of security arrangements it wants to be part of or not want to be part of. If a country don't want to join NATO, I fully respect that. We have good friends like Sweden and Finland. They don't want to join NATO. That's fine. It's up to them. But if they want to join NATO, like Ukraine or Georgia, it's for the 30 members of NATO and the applicant countries to decide, no one else. Russia cannot deny a sovereign nation the right to join. And I say that also knowing because I'm because some, some, some are telling the story that, that these are countries bordering Russia, so it will be kind of provocation to Russia if they join. It will be kind of an aggressive act. No, it is a when the Baltic countries join NATO, also border, bordering Russia, they did that through democratic processes and they exercised their sovereign right to decide their own path. And Russia has no right to regard us as a provocation or to try to deny them the right to make that sovereign decision. And I say this also because I'm from Norway. And Norway is a small country bordering Russia. And Russia, or the Soviet Union, in, back in 1949 when we joined, they disliked that Norway joined. But I'm very glad that in Washington and London and, uh, and Paris at that time, they said that it's for Norway to decide, not for the Soviet Union to deny a small neighbor to make his own decision. So the same principle should apply for all the countries that would like to join NATO today. It's sovereign right by all nations uh, to apply, and then it's the only members and no one else to decide whether they meet the NATO standards. That was a very long answer to a very short question. But it was excellent. Yeah. And by the way, I was just thinking, there was a time, it seems really long, long, long ago, it seems another life, there was a time when Russia itself was uh, considering partnership yeah. with NATO and working in some kind of partnership, yeah. not only with NATO, but also with the European Union. So yeah. things might evolve, hopefully, in the future. Yeah. Um, shall we take one question from, uh, uh, from uh, some students connected uh, from their rooms? And yeah. then we go back to... Perfect. We have a follow-up question from Milos uh, Mirkovic. So please, Milos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity. So, uh, Mr. Secretary General, I was uh, interested in how would you assess the state of play of the security in the Western Balkans, especially considering that we have two new member states, and uh, also having in mind the Russian influence, so maybe uh, especially commenting on the situation in Bosnia and maybe the state of play also uh, of democracy, let's say, in the region. Thank you very much. So first of all, uh, the Western Balkans uh, is of importance for Europe and for uh, NATO. Um, and uh, often we say in NATO that when our neighbors are stable, then we are more secure. Uh, and NATO has, again, together with the EU, but I'm going to speak on behalf of uh, NATO, uh, uh, we have a history in the Balkans, in the Western Balkans. We, we, after the end of the Cold War, you have to remember that during, for 40 years, NATO didn't operate outside our borders. It was in way, beyond our imagination that we should operate beyond NATO borders. We had one task, and that also deterred the Soviet Union. And then when the Cold War ended, people started to say that either NATO has to go uh, out of uh, area or out of business. Because the Soviet Union was not there anymore, the Warsaw Pact was there, not there anymore. And then the Balkan Wars, uh, while we were discussing this on a kind of theoretical uh, level, the Balkan Wars dragged us into a position where we had to move out of area. And it was a very long step for us to take to go from protecting as a NATO members in Europe to actually be involved in something beyond our borders. The Balkans is not far away, but politically, it was a very long step. And then we went into Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, helping to uh, end uh, the bloodshed uh, there uh, uh, in, in a big NATO mission uh, uh, well, in the mid-90s. Uh, mid uh, and then uh, towards the end of the same decade, in 1999, uh, we uh, uh, went into, or we, we had launched uh, uh, the air campaign um, in Serbia uh, and Kosovo uh, to help stop uh, 
uh, the fighting and the conflict um, uh, in, uh, in Serbia and, uh, and Kosovo. Um, uh, and since then, uh, NATO, and we also actually had some military presence in, 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 uh, in uh, North Macedonia, or uh, it was called Fyrum at that time. Um, we still have a presence in the uh, Western Balkans uh, uh, with some offices and uh, also some military presence uh, uh, in Sarajevo, in, uh, in Belgrade, in, uh, in, uh, uh, yeah, uh, until recently also in, uh, in Skopje, but now they have become uh, members. Um, uh, and, we, and, uh, and we have close uh, partners in the region. Um, I think for NATO, of course, what has really made a difference is that many of the countries in the Western Balkans, they have joined NATO. Uh, uh, so uh, so uh, uh, you have uh, uh, so Montenegro, North Macedonia, Albania, uh, and of course uh, you have also the, uh, Slovenia, Croatia, uh, former uh, republics in Yugoslavia, they are now uh, members of NATO. This has been important for NATO, uh, uh, but it has also helped to stabilize the region, uh, uh, preserve peace, and uh, we're, again, some of them are members of EU, and together this has uh, helped to uh, uh, promote uh, economic development, prosperity, um, uh, and important for the whole uh, region. Uh, we also have a military presence in Kosovo, um, uh, helping to protect all communities uh, there. We strongly support the EU uh, 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 um, facilitated uh, Bel uh, Belgrade Prishna, Prishna Belgrade dialogue. Um, Federica worked hard on that, and I supported her. Uh, we continue to support efforts of the European uh, Union. Um, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is a is a, is a close uh, uh, partner. Uh, the uh, the three-party presidency just made a decision a uh, few days ago to 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 further uh, develop the partnership uh, with uh, uh, with uh, NATO. We welcome that at NATO. Um, uh, there are many challenges and many problems in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but I think that one of the main things that NATO has done there is to try to uh, build multi-ethnic uh, defense and security institutions, uh, armed forces, uh, and by that trying to reduce the risk for new conflicts and new fighting in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We continue to provide help for reform uh, and to reduce tensions in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, uh, uh, then, um, uh, I th then I would like to add that, of course, some, some of the countries in the region have joined NATO, uh, free democratic decisions. Uh, some are, in, uh, are, in, are uh, still aspiring, like Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, uh, and we help them with, with, with reforms. At the end of the day, this will be a decision for Bosnia and Herzegovina and for NATO. Um, uh, and then we have a country like Serbia. They don't aspire for NATO membership. They aspire for EU membership, but not for NATO membership. And I, for me, it's important to say that that's the decision I fully respect. So we, we respect also when countries decide to be neutral. So when, when Serbia decides to be a neutral country, as not aiming for or applying or working for NATO membership, that's fine. We will never force a country to join. But then we appreciate the fact that we can have Serbia as a partner. Uh, we don't agree on all issues, as we hardly do inside the alliance either. But, but, but then we work together. Uh, and actually, uh, NATO and Serbia, we work together on issues. Uh, also, for instance, we had an exercise uh, not so long ago. I went to, to, to Belgrade, uh, uh, an exercise on civil uh, um, preparedness uh, and so on. So I strongly believe that NATO should strengthen its partnership with different countries uh, in the region. Uh, working with the European Union, actually an ex excellent example of where NATO and the European Union uh, complement each other. Uh, EU have, has many tools that NATO doesn't have, the economic tools and other tools. We have some uh, military presence there, and we are working together, uh, and uh, because we share the same neighborhood, we want peace and stability, and, uh, and uh, hopefully we can help to promote that together uh, in the Western Balkans. Thank you, Jens. I come back uh, to the room. Maybe I'll turn to Marta. Good morning. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, so my question, um, historically, EU-NATO cooperation has been blocked by some member states of each organization. In your speech, you mentioned a stronger EU-NATO cooperation. What future do you see for that, keeping in mind these political obstacles? Thank you. 
you are right that there are some political obstacles, uh, but uh, we have been able to find ways uh, to uh, cooperate um, and work together because it's so obvious that it, it is uh, in the interest of both uh, the European Union and uh, NATO. Uh, and many of the members are the same. So it will be very strange if we're not able to work together. Uh, I am very much aware of that not all EU members are NATO members and not all NATO members are uh, EU members. Uh, but as I said, uh, more than 90%, I think it's 93% of the people living in the European Union, they live in a NATO country. And it will be strange if we cannot cooperate because for many of these countries it's about cooperating with themselves. Uh, so if we end up in a situation with two institutions uh, that share the same neighborhood, the same challenges, the same values, uh, from, in many ways, actually were established for the same historical reasons are not able, uh, and have the same members to a large extent, are not able to work together, then there's something fundamentally wrong with the people working in those institutions. And that's not the case. So, uh, so therefore, we, we, are, we have been able to work together. And this was what Federica realized when she was uh, high representative, is, is something I have seen. And, and therefore, it is really something I am pleased to see that uh, there are, of course, difficulties and, and, and challenges and, and, and many other things we have to overcome. Uh, but uh, compared to where we were uh, not many years ago, and especially before 2014, uh, we have really been able to lift uh, the NATO EU cooperation to uh, new uh, levels. We identified, I think it was 76 different areas where we work uh, together. Um, uh, but also in respect of the fact that we have not the same members, uh, also all the same members, and the fact that we know that there are some political sensitivities, I remember Federica, and I also uh, try to say that as elegant as Federica, that uh, we respect uh, the, the integrity and the decision-making procedures of each and every uh, organization. So, of course, EU is EU, and NATO is NATO, and we make our independent uh, decisions, but then we find ways to work together, or at least work in parallel, to coordinate our, our, our uh, activities. So, so I think this pragmatic approach is the only way to, uh, to also uh, continue to do this in the future. You know, Jens, when, when, while you were answering this, uh, this question, I was actually trying to remember the exact wording of that disclaimer, and I, I, I perfectly remember now I'm, I'm, I'm free, I can share anecdotes more, most than yeah. ever, uh, that at every time we had a, a ministerial meeting, because uh, Jens was uh, always invited and kind enough to come mm. to all the foreign ministers' meeting of the, uh, and defense ministers' meeting of the European Union, and I was mm. going to the NATO ones. And, he, at a certain moment, told me, how is it that you always say exactly the same wording at the end of this session? Yeah. And this is because actually in the European Union, there is a sort of disclaimer. Uh, that is the one that he quoted. And imagine, I forgot it. <laughs> uh, maybe we can get a question from, uh, uh, from the online connected students. Uh, yes, we will have two questions from Anna-Lisa Medellin. Uh, hello, Secretary General. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, my name is Annalisa Merilind. I'm a MOTA student so for Transatlantic Affairs, and I come from uh, Tallinn, Estonia. Um, and actually, um, my, my first question is um, about uh, the, the rise of China and the uh, military might and, and uh, increasingly assertive behavior. Um, and so, um, uh, the, uh, the, there is this uh, strategic forum uh, called the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, which is between uh, the US, uh, Japan, Australia and India. And then my question is, uh, uh, with regard to, to China's rise, uh, what is the state of NATO's cooperation with the, the Quad um, and how do you see it developing in the future? Um, and uh, if I may, uh, then also uh, I had one question from a colleague of mine, a second year MATA student, uh, Jana Maizurate, who is from Georgia. Uh, and she was actually asking a follow up question to already what was uh, being discussed uh, earlier on. Um, and, and she was asking um, uh, if Russia does not have a third party veto right, uh, then uh, when do you expect the uh, Bucharest summit uh, promises to be fulfilled uh, vis a vis Georgia? Uh, would you explain that uh, neglecting Russian aggression in 2008 led to the Ukrainian crisis in 2014? And where do you see NATO's role in resolving the creeping occupation of Georgia by Russia? Thank you very much. Um, for, first on uh, uh, China. Um, 
The rise of China is going to be uh, defining for uh, transatlantic cooperation uh, in the years to come, uh, uh, because it, it will it will it is uh, uh, it will impact and has already started to impact uh, the global balance of power. Um, and uh, again, NATO should remain a regional alliance, North America and uh, Europe. But we have to take into account that the threats and the challenges we face in this region, the North Atlantic region, they are becoming more and more global. That's the case for terrorism, cyber, space, disinformation campaigns. It doesn't matter. These are really, truly global challenges. So NATO should remain a regional alliance, but we need to address global challenges. There's no way you can protect this region without having a global approach. And that also applies for the rise of China. Uh, and uh, uh, China will soon have the biggest economy in the world. Uh, that dem demonstrates also that the rise of China also represents opportunities for our economies, for our markets, for, for trade. And of course, the rise of China has been extremely important when it comes to lifting uh, uh, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. So, so, so it's not a black and white issue, uh, black or white. It's, 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 a, it's, it's, uh, it's actually something which, which we also see uh, some opportunities related to for all of us. Having said that, we have to understand that it's something fundamentally new, that the country with the biggest economy and all of the second largest defense budget in the world is, a, is an authoritarian country that doesn't share our values. And we, see that, and we see that in the way they are cracking down on democratic rights uh, protests in Hong Kong, how they uh, uh, prosecute minorities, the Uyghurs in their own country, uh, how they actually use modern technology, social media, to monitor people in a way you have never seen before. Uh, and, how, and how they actually openly said that they don't share our democratic values. And also how they try to reshape the international order, undermining the rules-based international order that we have built together for uh, decades. They are investing heavily in new military capabilities, that uh, uh, new, new nuclear weapons, uh, long-range missiles, uh, intercontinental missiles, uh, just over the last five years, they have deployed uh, 80 new battleships, uh, uh, which is actually the, the same amount of uh, naval uh, capabilities as the total uh, 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 navy of the United Kingdom. So they're adding a lot, making uh, China more and more global military uh, power. And then they try to expand their influence uh, in the South China Sea, taking control there, they are threatening Taiwan, and uh, we have seen how they are bullying uh, countries all over the world. Bullying Australia when Australia asked for an independent uh, uh, investigation into the origins of the uh, coronavirus. Uh, Canada, where they have arrested uh, 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 two Canadian uh, citizens as a kind of as a, as a punishment for Canadian behavior which is totally un unacceptable. And I know it myself because I was Prime Minister in Norway when the Norwegian Nobel Peace Prize Committee awarded the Peace Prize to a Chinese dissident. And then China immediately broke all ties, boycotted trade, political ties, to punish Norway. So this way of behaving as a growing uh, economic and military power is really undermining the world we like to build, based on rules, respect to sovereignty, uh, international law. And the challenge is that this is not one country among many. It is the biggest economy in the world, if you measure in, uh, in purchasing power, uh, uh, in taking into account the difference in cost between different countries, and soon also the biggest economy in market values. Shifting the global balance of power. And therefore, for me, it's so obvious that, uh, that for instance, when the United States expressed concerns about the size of China, 
the military science, the economic science, leading in, in, in technology in many areas, artificial intelligence and so on. For me, that makes it just obvious that we need to be together. Because if we are alone, we will all be small compared to, to China, even the United States in many areas, economy. So for the United States, this is a big advantage to have 29 friends and allies in NATO. And I tell Americans that NATO is not only, in a way, good for Europe. It's not, NATO is not only about the US protecting Europe. NATO is about we protecting each other, including the United States. We saw that after the 9-11 attack on the United States. But we also see it when it comes to addressing the rise of, uh, of, uh, of China. So uh, NATO has come a long way. Uh, uh, not long ago, we hardly addressed the rise of China at all. Uh, at the NATO summit in December 2019, we for the first time had language on China in the statement from NATO leaders. And since then, we have seen development, for instance, uh, uh, when it comes to resilience, um, uh, protecting of infrastructure, because it's not about moving NATO into the Asia-Pacific, but it's about taking into account that China is coming closer to us in cyber, uh, in the Arctic, in Africa, investing in our critical infrastructure in Europe. We saw the discussion we had about uh, telecommunications and, and 5G. We have seen an enormous convergence of views among allies that we need uh, uh, 5G communications, which, we, which can be reliable uh, uh, and take into account uh, the risk related to foreign ownership and foreign control. So NATO has stepped up. We address and try to understand, assess and respond uh, also by strengthening our resilience. Um, uh, part of that is also, of course, to realize the importance of working with partners. So we are stepping up our cooperation with the partners in the, uh, in the Asia Pacific, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea. And I welcome also the United States are, of course, also uh, stepping up, strengthening their uh, uh, partnership cooperation with uh, partners uh, in, uh, in, the, also in, in, in Asia and the, and the Pacific. Thank you, Jens. Uh, we come back to the room. Uh, I promised Philip to go next, and then uh, uh, we'll go to Christine. Thank you very much, Madam Rector, and thank you very much, Secretary Janice Stoltenberg, for joining us today. This is truly a unique opportunity, which I'm sure we're all very happy to be here for. During your um, position as Secretary General, you've signed two agreements with the European Union, the 2016 agreement and the 2018 agreement, which I'm sure does a lot of work with the Rector in her former capacity. However, one of the most important agreements that remain is the 2002 Berlin Plus Agreement between the EU and NATO in the EU being able to use NATO's capabilities. Uh, this agreement has been wavering in these past years. In fact, the only operation that operates under it is Operation Altea in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So I want to ask you, what do you believe is the future of the Berlin Plus Agreement and will it be replaced once or if indeed Operation Altea ends? Thank you very much. You are right uh, that uh, it is only in Bosnia and Herzegovina that we, uh, this uh, has any practical relevance, the Berlin uh, 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 Agreement that was signed many years ago or agreed many years ago. Um, uh, uh, so far, we have not seen any need for, uh, for uh, using that uh, mechanism in other missions and operations than in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, I will not speculate whether that will be uh, or may be the case uh, in the future, uh, but we have actually found other ways to work together. Um, um, for instance, in Iraq, where you now uh, see a, an expanded NATO training mission, uh, and of course, when I say NATO training mission, that includes a lot of EU allies, uh, uh, and also some, some uh, and not only EU allies, actually Sweden, Sweden and Finland are, are, are considering to be part of this uh, training mission. Uh, <clears throat> so, so it's a NATO framework, NATO training mission, but EU uh, NATO allies, uh, like for instance Germany are planning to be part of this, uh, and many others, uh, France, Italy, uh, or at least, yeah, yeah, they have all declared interest. Uh, uh, so. Uh, so, so EU is so EU members are part of it through the NATO training mission, and then also some partners like Finland, Finland and Sweden. Then the EU, they are also in, in Iraq, but they are doing uh, different things, complementing each other. Uh, and again, a kind of pragmatic way, instead of trying to establish a kind of common uh, 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 mission operation uh, using uh, the Berlin Plus uh, mechanisms, 
uh, which may be a bit complicated. We just agree in parallel uh, to work together, and then we fulfill and complement each other uh, in Iraq. So there is a big difference between Iraq and, and, and Bosnia-Herzegovina, but, but it illustrates that EU and NATO can find ways of working together without using these formal uh, structures, uh, but just pragmatic ways of uh, working together. I can actually uh, not only confirm but underline what, uh, uh, what you said. Uh, indeed, uh, well, I, I remember I was in office uh, uh, when the European Union established the, the mission in, uh, in Iraq. I remember the coordination, and which is doing still now, I think, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the support to the um, uh, security sector reform on the uh, civilian side. And I remember that contacts at our level and the staff level between the European Union militaries, uh, and, and not only militaries, in that case, uh, mainly not militaries, and NATO staff was constant, especially as NATO was planning to establish their own uh, presence there. Uh, and uh, it worked perfectly well. Indeed, there are ways of establishing coordination and cooperation. Afghanistan was another example mm -hmm. where the European Union was training the police. And, uh, and obviously NATO was doing uh, something different. And there was a very close cooperation on the ground and in, at the level of headquarters. So I can only confirm what, uh, what you said. Uh, maybe we get one question from uh, uh, the online first. Uh, okay, so, so we follow up uh, a question on China from Michelangelo. Mr. Secretary General, first of all, many thanks for your most interesting presentation and discussion. Uh, my name is Michelangelo and I study in the International Relations and Diplomacy Studies Department at the college. And I also had a question regarding the rise of China and its impact on global security, which you touched upon already. I would, last, um, I would like to ask whether, in your own view, you believe that China can rise peacefully in the coming decade, as it has been doing for many years, without provoking a major conflict in the process, which would probably force the involvement of NATO. Or in Sun Tzu's words, do you believe that China can actually win the battle for regional and global hegemony without needing to fight it? Thank you very much. So our, our task, our responsibility is to make sure that uh, China's, China's rise does not lead to conflict. Uh, um, um, and, uh, and, and that's also one of the reasons why uh, we are uh, setting the rights of China, uh, why we have put the rights of China higher on the NATO uh, agenda. because. Even though we are not, we, we remain a regional alliance, the rights of China matters for our uh, security. Uh, and it matters for our values, uh, uh, democracy and the rule of law. Um, uh, uh, and I think that, uh, in many ways, I think this just highlights again the importance of standing together. Uh, and uh, we have said again and again that uh, the best way to preserve uh, uh, peace is to uh, be committed to collective defense, uh, uh, because uh, there will be no attack uh, um, as against any NATO ally as long as it's very clearly uh, conveyed that uh, uh, the whole alliance stands uh, together. I know there are written a lot of analysis and books uh, about the, the, the risk of when you have a rising power challenging Hegemon, uh, it will in a way always lead to war, uh, uh, the Thucydides trap. Uh, uh, there was a book recently written by um, uh, as a professor at Harvard about the, uh, the destined for war. It's about the rise of China. And, and he goes all the way back to, to, uh, to Sparta and Athens, uh, where the, uh, the rise of Sparta and the fear it instilled in Athens made war inevitable. That's, in a way, the main message. Uh, uh, but in those historical studies, where they actually have studied, I think it's about 16 different cases when you have a rising power challenging an, uh, an existing big power, most of the, those cases end in war, but not all of them. So it is possible. Uh, and therefore, we need to learn and make sure that uh, the rise of China does not lead uh, to uh, war and conflict. Uh, we will all be losers, uh, also China. Uh, if that leads to uh, conflict. And uh, for me, that just highlights the importance of working with the part. Also, NATO allies are strong, 50% of the world's military might, 50% of the world's economic might. But if you add that with like-minded democracies, uh, for instance, in the, in the broader Asia-Pacific region, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, Korea, and others, uh, uh, India, uh, then, then, then it's the formidable uh, force. 
Uh, and, and for me, it underlines the importance of building these relationships, standing up for our values at home, but also uh, the international uh, uh, rules-based uh, order. Um, and, uh, and by that, and also engaging with China. Um, of course, then it's not always for NATO, but for instance, it is important to engage with China on issues like climate change. Uh, uh, there's no way you can solve climate change without working with China. Uh, and, then, uh, and then convey a message that we are ready uh, uh, to engage, to work, also NATO. Uh, I met the Chinese foreign minister. Um, um, there are some military uh, contacts also between China and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and NATO. And then by that, uh, demonstrating uh, our unity, our strength, but also our willingness to uh, avoid, prevent any kind of, uh, of uh, conflict. So uh, that's, that's always the, the case, uh, to, to in a way convey a, a message of strength and unity, uh, a commitment to our values, the rules-based order, but at the same time uh, an openness to, uh, to engage, to talk, uh, to uh, solve common problems, climate change, whatever it may be, uh, and also reduce uh, the scope for misunderstandings uh, and, uh, and the miscalculations that can lead to conflict. I would ask uh, one moment of patience uh, to Christine and the others because I, I actually have a follow-up question. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most interesting um, statements and uh, policy changes you are introducing as a Secretary General in, in the Alliance is this focus on the global uh, new frontiers of threats and challenges that are not so military in nature but that might uh, that cannot be ignored by a military alliance like NATO, like climate change for instance. Uh, and as you mentioned, the fact that on climate change uh, uh, there might be some uh, work to be done uh, with, with China, and this seems uh, inevitable and indeed very much needed. I was wondering if you can share with us a little bit uh, more about uh, uh, NATO's uh, plans or NATO's projects or ideas on uh, uh, what can be the role of, of NATO, of a military alliance like NATO, in uh, addressing climate change. As a, as a threat, yeah. because yeah. already de defining climate change as a, as a threat yeah. is a, a shift in, in paradigm. Yeah. Uh, thank well, NATO, we always say that we have to be able to uh, defend all our allies against any threat from any direction. Uh, uh, and again, back in the Cold War, it was one threat, one direction, it was Soviet Union. And now it's a mul much more complex, uh, multifaceted uh, uh, threat environment we are facing. And one of the threats we face is climate change. Uh, because climate change is, as we often say, a, a crisis multiplier. A lot of the conflicts um, and, uh, and fight uh, over resources, water, uh, uh, food, uh, uh, Arab also land, uh, uh, is more or less directly linked to, to climate change, global warming, and it will be more so in the future. Uh, migration will be triggered by uh, uh, climate change because people cannot live and work uh, uh, where they used to uh, uh, do because uh, uh, the world is changing, climate is changing, wilder, wetter, uh, uh, windier weather uh, will change uh, how people can live and where they uh, uh, will live. That will uh, 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 increase uh, uh, crisis uh, in many places. And many people have analyzed, for instance, the uh, the, the, the war in Syria and link that also to the fight about resources and link that again to, to climate change. The Sahel region is also, it's not only climate change, but climate change adds to uh, the tensions and the conflict. Uh, so I see uh, for NATO actually three uh, roles or tasks related to climate change. One is to understand, monitor, fully uh, uh, assess the security implications of global warming, climate change. Because climate change impacts our security, therefore it matters for NATO, because NATO is about security. And we need to understand that. So that's about analyzing. But to understand is the first step to be able to respond. The second role NATO should have uh, is that we need to adapt the way we do our work. We need to adapt NATO. And it's very basic. A lot of our infrastructure will be directly impact, impacted by uh, uh, climate change. 
rising sea levels will impact a lot of uh, naval bases, infrastructure. Uh, we have seen that, for instance, in Norfolk, Virginia, where uh, there are naval bases, including a NATO headquarters, they, they see flooding as a big, big problem. And, we, and I have seen numbers, very high numbers, uh, related to how much of military infrastructure, NATO infrastructure, that will be impacted by, uh, by climate uh, change, uh, also, uh, rising sea levels. But rising sea levels is only one part. Melting ice is another part. It will str it's strange, um, change the strategic environment up in the high north, where much more will be uh, available for, for shipping, for traffic, military, but also civilian use when the North Pole is melting, or at least the Arctic ice is melting, um, it will impact such basic things as uniforms and the way we do uh, uh, military operations. Uh, uh, we operate uh, in Iraq. In Baghdad last summer, it was more than 50 degrees for many, many days. And of course, when you have more extreme weather, extreme heat, it matters what kind of uniform weapon equipment, uh, vehicles you have. More wet, windy, extreme weather. Military, they operate out there in nature. So when nature becomes more extreme, we need to adapt the way we operate. So this is everything from the big decisions about infrastructure to smaller decisions about clothing, equipment, ammunition, whatever. So we need to adapt the way we conduct military operations uh, to be able to operate in more extreme weather climate change. And the third element uh, of the NATO response is that we should be part of uh, the effort to reduce emissions. Of course, NATO will remain a military alliance, uh, uh, and the big efforts is, is uh, to, uh, to make new agreements and so on will be done by you and other, others. But we should play our part in supporting those efforts. Uh, and we know that uh, military operations, if you see a battle tank or a uh, aircraft carrier and so on, it's not, it's not, the first thing you think about is not, it's green. Uh, meaning it's uh, also green in, in the meaning <laughs> environmental friendly. Um, they use a lot of energy. Uh, for, for, for good reasons. Because this is heavy stuff. Um, but we know that it emits uh, CO2, uh, CO2, uh, uh, green uh, climate change or greenhouse gas. Uh, and we also know that there are ways to reduce those emissions, which will both make it more environmentally friendly, but at the same time uh, actually increase our operational strength. Because in many military operations, if you read books about the Second World War uh, or the First World War or the Afghan uh, 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 war and military operations, the supply of fuels, if you read, read, read about the rumor in, the, in North Africa, the one of the big, big, big vulnerabilities was the supply of fuel over the, uh, over the Mediterranean. So supply of fuels has been so critical for so many military operations for so many years. Uh, so if you can reduce dependency on fossil fuels, you reduce emissions, but you also increase uh, the resilience, the strength of our military operations. In Afghanistan, one of the most vulnerable things uh, over decades has been the transportation of a lot of diesel for uh, cars, vehicles, uh, but also for just uh, aggregates to make electric po uh, power. If you can have more solar power, more biofuels, uh, local produced uh, 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 energy and or less energy consumption in our military operations, energy efficiency, we will reduce emissions, help curb the global warming, but at the same time also uh, make our military missions less uh, vulnerable. So uh, we should set the gold standard in NATO for how we conduct military operations in an effective um, uh, a way, but in a way which is also at the same time uh, more environmentally uh, friendly. Excellent. I find this fascinating. By the way, uh, we are going to work on uh, our own uh, Green Deal in the college yeah. uh, in, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, Christine. Thank you so much for your presentation. So you mentioned in your presentation is the new challenges, the new technologies. So I have a more specific question. Do you see any potential EU NATO cooperation in setting international standards for artificial intelligence? 
Yeah, also at least I see a need that uh, like-minded countries and like-minded institutions as EU and NATO come together <coughs> and try to figure out how do we develop uh, some ethical standards for these new technologies. Especially when it comes to, also for, for many reasons, but for NATO, especially when it comes to uh, uh, the uh, application, the use of these technologies in military uh, uh, systems, in, in new uh, weapons. The challenge is, of course, that our potential adversaries, they are now uh, developing uh, these technologies at a very high pace. Uh, and, 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 and they are introducing new technologies in their uh, systems more and more. Um, 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 and, uh, and, and therefore, there is a, the, we, need, we need to find, a, so we also need to maintain our technological edge. And artificial intelligence is something we already use in systems. And, and, and artificial intelligence is not something separate from what we have. When we have new fighter jets or, or new drones, they, they use a lot of new technologies, new disruptive technology. We implement that in those systems already. So we are already in a world where these new disruptive technologies are used, autonomous systems, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, big data, and so on. The challenge is how do we make sure that we keep the technological edge, which always has been the, the advantage of, of, of the West, uh, uh, NATO, uh, uh, but at the same time uh, trying to develop ethical standards uh, and also arms control. We don't have the full answer to that today, uh, but again, one part of my NATO 2030 or the NATO 2030 agenda uh, is how to uh, uh, develop ethical standards um, for uh, new disruptive technologies uh, and how also to uh, apply arms control. Uh, up to now, arms control has been mainly about counting warheads, putting uh, so a number, we agree that should not, not be more than 1,550 uh, 1, warheads on each side, Russia, so, uh, the United States, strategic warheads. That's an easy number to adjust and to measure. But now, how do you do arms control in cyberspace? How do you count algorithms, if that's possible to count at all? Uh, and how do you apply the thinking of arms control and then also ethical standards with banning chemical weapons uh, or banning uh, uh, other weapon systems, as we have done up till now? How do we apply that same kind of thinking uh, in this new area? We, we have to be honest and say that nobody has that answer today and, 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 and even, uh, to a lesser degree, a political agreement on how to... Uh, uh, address it and do something about it, but it is an uh, increasing understanding that this is an issue we cannot hide uh, or, or deny. Uh, the last thing I would say about this is that living in Belgium uh, reminds me uh, uh, of the brutality of the First World War. I am, you know, because I, I, I'm from Norway and the First World War, that was, we were not part of that, so, so, so I, I have to be honest, it was when I came to, to Belgium that I realized how brutal and how bad that was. For me, the World War was the second. Uh, the, the First War was something uh, so not so much affected. But when you go to the battlefields in Belgium, to, to Ypres, for instance, you, you, you read about the brutality. And the brutality of that war is that that's the first big war where they used industrial power to kill each other. And, and that changed. The, many of the soldiers that went into the First World War, they didn't have helmets. And they had color uh, pants, because that was kind of the Napoleonic War way of fighting. And they had that kind of equipment moving into industrialized war with the uh, with with uh, cannons and, and bombs and all that, and and and, and uh, gas. So the industrial revolution changed the nature of warfare in an absolutely fundamental way. These new technologies we are now introducing are going to change the nature of warfare in the same way. Also, as fundamentally as the Industrial Revolution. And therefore, we need uh, to, yeah. And then come back to the question. Yes, of course, this is an area where, uh, where NATO and EU should see if there are something we can find to work together on. And also an area where uh, EU has a lot of tools where it address these technologies regardless of weapons. But of course, there's a blurred line between civilian use and military use of the same technologies.
Indeed, I think that uh, the famous normative power of the European Union mm -hmm. could uh, really uh, helpfully be applied. Uh, uh, maybe this is something for our law department to look into, uh, to mm -hmm. how, uh, especially the, I always thought the accountability, uh, not only the ethical, but also the accountability, the, the, the ch command chain uh, on weaponization of artificial intelligence. But maybe we can get, uh, uh, if this is okay for you, Jens, we still have some, 10, 15 minutes, uh, we uh, get a couple of questions. You want to take maybe two together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been very generous. I can try to be shorter <laughs> also, so we, I can uh, take two and two and whatever, yeah. Perfect, yeah. good. We try to take two. Okay, so first question from Adiz uh, and after from Victoria. Um, thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, for taking the time to come here. And. Uh, Thank you, uh, Madam Rector, and to all the organizers for organizing this. My question is about NATO in space. Um, it, it's only recently been declared an operational theater, and the EU has quite recently entered into the space domain too. How do you see that relationship evolving, especially with regards to the fact that the EU considers it not to be a security area, so the questions of duplication of forces, etc., come up? Do you think it's NATO and the EU will be able to cooperate here, or will it be another one of those uh, duplication issues? Hello. We take another one. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary General, for uh, just to ask a question. My name is Victoria, and I'm, I'm from Armenia. Um, my question uh, is the question that my, my president wanted to ask you back in October. As you know, uh, at the end of the last year, uh, as confirmed by the intelligence services of the US, France and uh, Russia, Turkey has been identified as one of the perpetrators of the disastrous war in Nagorno-Karabakh with active military support to Azerbaijan. I would like to ask why Turkey, a NATO member, was involved in a war that had nothing to do um, with NATO or its interests in the region and why has nothing has been done to restrain Turkey's involvement, knowing that the weapons made by NATO, by NATO member states, were used during indiscriminate attacks on civilians in Nagorno-Karabakh. And um, in, the same, in the same context, this new post-war reality in the South Caucasus, meaning Turkey's transformation into a regional superpower with a larger control in the South Caucasus and more upcoming connectivity to the Central Asian countries. Doesn't that bother NATO member states? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. First, on, uh, on space. As I, first of all, space is becoming more and more important um, uh, for civilian purposes. It has been for a long time, but uh, uh, also more and more important for uh, military purposes. Not the, uh, in a way that NATO is planning to militarize space, but what is going on in space matters what uh, takes place on the Earth. Uh, everything from communications, uh, uh, command and control, uh, uh, monitoring, uh, intelligence, uh, 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 weather forecast, all of these things are dependent on uh, space satellites, space uh, capabilities. Uh, so we have to make sure that they are protected, uh, we have to make sure that they will function in, in, in peace, uh, crisis and uh, conflict, because uh, modern uh, military operations are uh, uh, older today, uh, depend on uh, a wide range of space uh, capabilities. And therefore, NATO has uh, developed our cooperation, uh, the efforts, the work we do on, on, on making sure that we have available space capabilities. Uh, as always in NATO, this is very often about drawing on national capabilities. It's not about NATO owning a satellite, but it's about NATO working with, with Italy or with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Germany or, or other uh, allies. Uh, on, uh, on, uh, on making sure that they provide uh, to NATO missions and operations uh, to collect the defense missions in Europe or, or counterterrorism missions in, 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 in Afghanistan, uh, uh, the necessary space capabilities. And I, to be honest, I, th I, I don't see any big problem. Actually, I see a potential for working uh, with the European Union uh, because the European Union is, of course, investing in these capabilities, or EU members are investing in these capabilities. EU has some work on these capabilities. And as long as this, what we always said is that as long as these new uh, European capabilities, civilian or military, are available for NATO allies, if that satellite is developed by some uh, money from the European Union and from some EU member states, as long as the information uh, these satellites uh, uh, is able to transmit is available for NATO allies, which it is because it's very much the same allies, uh, the same countries, uh, then it's fine. 
So, so I, I, often I think we shouldn't make a problem out of something which is not a problem, and, and, and that many allies are both members of EU and NATO and have, for instance, capabilities like satellites providing information both for civilian and military use for NATO operations and, and maybe EU activities, whatever it is. That, that works fine. Uh, so uh, so um, most of all, I think we just have to work together on, uh, on uh, the issue of space and technology. Then uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. First of all, I, I am of course concerned about the situation. Um, uh, I was extremely um, uh, concerned when we saw the bloodshed, the fighting. Uh, I, uh, I, I know that uh, it's still uh, a difficult situation in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, but I welcome the fact that at least that the fighting has stopped and, uh, and there is a political process. NATO is not part of that. Um, you are right that the NATO ally uh, uh, um, so has has supported uh, and, and expressed support to to one part in, in the conflict, but it's not uh, it's not a NATO mission. It's not a uh, uh, something that NATO has has uh, has uh, been part uh, of, and I think it just reflects that NATO, of course, is important and and we protect each other, but NATO allies don't not, don't agree on everything, and historically we have seen that NATO allies have been engaged in military operations where. Not all allies agree. Also, going back to the Suez crisis in '56 or the Vietnam War in the '60s and '70s, or the Iraq War in 2003. Uh, I'm not saying that these wars and conflicts are not important. They were extremely important. Uh, uh, but allies had different views. Uh, some allies supported the Iraq uh, operation in 2003 or, or war in 2003. So other allies were heavily against. Uh, it was never a NATO mission, a NATO uh, operation. Uh, so, so I, I, uh, NATO is not part. Uh, 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 NATO supports the uh, political uh, efforts, and uh, we think it's extremely important that we prevent uh, resumption of a, a military conflict uh, uh, fighting. Thank you, Jens. Uh, maybe we go for the last question to Omar. Thank you, Rector. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, my question would be on the. Uh, more like on the fragmentation of NATO members, like we see Turkey buying S-400 missile systems from Russia, and then uh, we see a lot of criticism on that on Turkey. On the same, uh, on the other hand, we see Turkey uh, supporting a government of national accord in Libya, but we see France uh, supporting Haftar against a UN uh, recognized and government of national accord that uh, is supported by Turkey and Italy. So we see NATO members uh, in different sides, sides in different areas of the world, in different topics. So how can we explain this fragmentation of NATO members? Is this the new, new normal for uh, NATO alliance in the 21st century? Thank you. It's always easier when all NATO allies agree uh, and have a common position on uh, every issue. So, as Secretary General, that would have made my life much easier. Uh, but when you say that, you ask whether this is a new normal, if I, if I could say anything, I would say that this has been the case for decades. It's to some extent the same issue I just answered. It is nothing new that allies disagree. Uh, the strength of NATO is that despite these disagreements on important issues, we have always been able to <coughs> unite around our core tasks to protect and defend each other. But, but also in, nine, in 56, just uh, seven years after we were, we were established by the Suez crisis, where, where, where allies uh, seriously disagreed on how to deal with the situation in Egypt and the Suez Canal. Then, uh, uh, then in the 1960s, France decided to leave the military cooperation in, uh, in the alliance. That was not an easy decision for NATO and, and, and for France. Um, uh, in the 70s, we had different views about, for instance, uh, colonial warfare of uh, some members in Africa, uh, and, uh, and we had uh, the Vietnam War. Allies disagreed. Uh, and uh, as I said, we had, uh, as recently as 2003, the Iraq War. I'm not saying this because I'm underestimating the importance and the difficulties related to these disagreements. They have been difficult all the way, but it's nothing new. So, so, so the, the strength of NATO is that despite these serious differences on serious issues, colonial warfare in Africa or, or the Vietnam War or the Iraq War and, and, and other things, 
we have been the most successful alliance in history because we have been able to concentrate on our core task. I will always try to do whatever I can to minimize disagreements, to solve differences, and when we are able to do that, that's the best thing. When we're not able to do that, my task is to prevent those differences for uh, creating uh, problems which are undermining NATO as a military alliance. Uh, <clears throat> on some of the issues you mentioned, Eastern Mediterranean uh, and so on, uh, well, there are obvious differences. Uh, uh, um, and, um, uh, but, over the, but, but then I think that what, what, what is important for me is to try to then use NATO as a platform to reduce differences, reduce tensions, prevent any escalation. And for instance, when it comes to Eastern Mediterranean and, uh, and uh, the differences we have seen between two uh, NATO allies, Greece and uh, Turkey, uh, over the last weeks, months, we have seen at least some positive steps. Uh, partly, uh, we have seen that Greece have declared that, uh, sorry, Turkey has, has declared that they will not deploy this Oric Rise, this uh, sh ship that uh, conducts these seismic surveys uh, in disputed waters. I have welcomed that. Uh, we have been able at NATO to establish what we call a deconfliction mechanism uh, because we need to avoid that when we see more Greek and Turkish military presence in the Eastern Med, we need to avoid coming back to where we were in the 1990s because in the 1990s, similar tensions between Greece and Turkey ended with casualties, downing of planes. And that was very serious. Uh, we have to do whatever we can to prevent that from happening again. And therefore, we have established this <coughs> de confliction mechanism where uh, military experts from Greece and Turkey meet. Uh, they have uh, canceled some exercises and, and agreed on some basic uh, uh, procedures of communications to try to prevent uh, uh, the same from happening again, and that this uh, uh, increased presence, uh, military presence, leads to uh, casualties, uh, uh, real uh, conflicts. Uh, talks have um, started, or uh, exploratory talks have started between Greece and Turkey on the un underlying disputes in the Eastern Med, uh, and NATO has helped to support uh, those efforts by establishing this deconfliction mechanism. So there are, uh, and I'm, I'm not saying that we have solved the problems, but I'm saying that given that we see the value of being together in this alliance, when we see serious differences, we should try to address, solve, if not, at least try to prevent them from uh, spreading and creating even more uh, problems for uh, all of us. Just brief from Libya, uh, we support uh, 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 the political process, the UN-led process. We have seen some positive steps there uh, too. Uh, so let's now just be strong uh, supporters of that political uh, process. Uh, okay, I think perhaps, yeah, I'll leave it to you. I, I think that, yeah, I think we should now wrap up. Uh, if I can yeah. ask you one uh, sentence uh, of advice for our students, because you have been, uh, as you said, always a convinced European. You have not studied at a college, but uh, you're focused on Europe a lot uh, and on international issues as well. Uh, and uh, here we have, uh, between here and uh, uh, our campus in uh, Poland, in Natalin, we have some 500 young, uh, uh, committed uh, and uh, um, and uh, young people, relatively young people, wondering what to do next. What would be your personal advice? For them? For them. Uh, as a, first of all, I think the most important thing is to be a good student uh, now. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but I, that, it is, um, it's, it's not only a joke, but it's serious. I, my, also I, I have never planned for anything, and I ended up here, to be honest. It, it's, it's almost true. Uh, I, for instance, I made, uh, I was a student myself, uh, I made one decision that I would never become a politician because I've been very active in, in the young uh, party, the young Labour Party back in Norway, and then I decided I should never go into politics. That was the only clear decision I uh, made. And then I was asked to become Deputy Minister of uh, Environment uh, in Norway back in 1990, and I said, okay, for a year, and now I'm here. So I think that I'm, I'm not against planning Actually, if, as a sector general, I should be very much in favor of planning, but, 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 but be focused on what you do now. That's the best thing. So, so write your thesis, read your books, do your homework, and then uh, some good th things will happen. Those who are too focused on the next step, they, I think they may, may, may lose the focus on what matters now. Um, 
so that's actually my most important uh, uh, advice. Uh, uh, and then I think uh, uh, if you have some good education, and then you, you have that if you attend this school, uh, this college, then, uh, then there will always be a need for you and your uh, knowledge. And be open. So that's not another advice. Is that as a, you have to be able to work with other people. Uh, one of my greatest uh, skills is that I'm very good at uh, receiving help. <laughs> that's I'm, I'm help, I, I love to be helped, uh, and uh, and don't be shy of asking for help, and don't be afraid of asking stupid questions. I asked stupid questions my whole life, and I continue to ask stupid questions. So if you are uh, willing to uh, and able to and open for being helped and focused on today and not too much uh, what is it, on the next job or next task, then uh, you will have a happy and good life. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jens. I fully subscribe. Uh, I think that now I can invite you to sign our uh, golden book uh, for guests of honor and also uh, receive a, a small present, a book of photos of Bruges uh, that I will not hand over to you because we cannot touch common things. But uh, okay, and thank you. you so much for having done this. Uh, maybe uh, one of next year's uh, next promotions, we will organize a visit to the NATO headquarters and come uh, to see you or your yeah. successor there. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank, thank you so much.